brothers and sisters, welcome back to these Behaviour Revolution Scriptures. My name is Mark, and uh, who's just put a task in front of me to start translating, transliterating, rewording, uh, just redoing the Scriptures in everyday 21st century slang English that we can all understand, can all come together and say, oh, that makes sense, great, fantastic, let's move on. Um, a lot of groundwork has been done behind us by lots of amazing men who have dissected the Hebrew and looked at Hebrew words and we still look at some Hebrew words ourselves and uh, but I want this to be fresh and English colloquial so that we can all understand what it's talking about without having to go through labor and intense study all the time you know some people are called to do that other people have busy lives and just want the gems of deliverance and they shouldn't have to go through the same journey to get the same uh, you know essence of truth you know, so uh, we've been looking at the life of Musha the last couple of episodes, and it's been very, very exciting for me to see that this is just a normal guy um, who has had a phenomenal life, brought up in a bit of a blended family. He's, he's a child of both worlds, neither fitting in here nor there. Um, miracle, miracle that he actually got born uh, or survived childhood to start with. He should have been drowned in the river. But on that very same river that everyone was drowned on, the babies were drowned on, he was delivered from. So just like Noak was delivered from through the ark. So we can see that he's been on a journey. And when we step back and look at this picture, that the story, the grand scheme of things is Yahusha wants his bride. Yahusha was sowing the seeds of his bride in Genesis. He, he birthed his bride growing them, maturing them. The end of Genesis with the 12 tribes of Israel. And now, as he told Abraham, he's put them into slavery, into, into the nations, into Egypt. They desperately wanted the nations to infiltrate, so now he's allowed them to infiltrate. Because when they come out, he didn't just want to have one nation of Israel. Uh, he wanted the whole world. So when he was going to uh, outstretch his arms, and throw the whole weight of his power into the situation, into the earth, and reveal his true name across the earth. He didn't just want it for one nation. He wanted all the dregs and the mixed multitudes and all the people that had attached themselves to his people to come out with them so that there would be a huge mixed multitude which would represent all the nations. So the nations would look and say, this, this amazing technological most advanced city the you know biggest metropolis nation on the earth has been laid waste by Yahusha. what could he do to us if we don't you know come under and you know get involved uh, so anyway it's very exciting where we're going guys so musha's come full circle he started in egypt and now he's come back to egypt with his brother He's been married, he's, he's got his two sons. Uh, Aaron suggested they stay back with the father-in-law because uh, this ain't a safe place. This isn't a, a good journey to go on. It's a real hideous, dangerous place in Egypt right now. Don't bring your family. So Musha's convinced them to stay with, with Yithro. And he's gone all the way back to Egypt with his brother, Aaron. And we saw also that Musha was just an everyday guy who was just no confidence didn't want to it's honest though having a real dialogue that's why i just reword this stuff so it's everyday colloquial 21st century what would it have sounded like if this was something happening beside us today in this language you'd be like get stuffed i don't want to do this this is hideous how can i go to these people and say Elohim has sent me to deliver you which one there's hundreds of Elohims. which one has sent you and he's like oh, don't don't dare compare me to those Elohim. don't compare me to those stupid pieces of wood and stone. I'm not going to be compared to them. I am Yahuwah. So tell them that. I'm the Elohim of your fathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaku. I'm Yahuwah, 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 and I've sent you to pay deliverer. to do it. I said it, so do it. <laughs> so he's there, he's convinced the, the leaders, leaders of the everyday people. Remember he bypasses all the princes and chieftains and you know, tribal chiefs and that sort of thing, and he goes straight to the tribe. He goes straight to the the, el the leaders, elders of the, the common folk. He goes straight to the common folk, 
and he performs these little miracles and he convinces them. So now, Musha and Aaron go to the Pharaoh. So Musha and Aaron went to the gates of the Pharaoh's palace and saw two young lions chained up, guarding the entrance, so that no one could go in or out unless ordered by the Pharaoh himself, whose diviners would cast a spell over the lions and remove them from the gateway. This is all in Yasha. Musha walked forward, lifted up the rod of Yahusha in his hand, and the chains fell from the lions, and they responded to Musha and Aaron with great joy, like a dog rejoices to see his master. So Musha and Aaron entered the Pharaoh's palace with the lions happily following them, and stood before the Pharaoh, who was completely startled. What are you doing in here? He demanded. Yahuwah, the mighty Elohim of Yisrael, has appeared to us, and he says to you, Pharaoh, let my people go so that they can celebrate a festival in honour to me in the wilderness. Oh, really? The Pharaoh said. Who on earth is this Yahuwah character? And why should I obey him? I don't know your so-called Elohim and do not bend to his authority. Yisrael is mine and I will never release them. But Aaron and Musha persisted. The Elohim of Yisrael has met with us, they declared. So let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness so we can slaughter sacrifices to Yahuwah our Elohim. If we don't, he will kill us with a plague or with the sword. And the Pharaoh replied, Speaking of Hebrews, you are distracting them from their tasks. Now get back to work. Look at all the people in the land that you are stopping from their work. He's a wicked man, isn't he? And that same day, the Pharaoh sent this order to the Egyptian slave drivers and the site masters. Do not supply any more straw for making bricks. Make the Hebrews get it themselves. But still require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy maggots. That's why they're crying out, Boo-hoo, let us go to make sacrifices to our Elohim. Hell no. Load them down with more hard labour. Make them sweat and bleed. That'll teach them to listen to these pathetic liars. So the people of Yisrael scattered throughout the land of Egypt in search of stubble to use as straw, while the Egyptian slave drivers continued to push harder. Meet your daily quota of bricks, just as you did when we provided you with straw, they demanded. Whipping the Yisraelite foreman when they had whipping the Yisraelite foreman they had put in charge of the workers. Why haven't you met your quotas either yesterday or today? They demanded. So the Israelite foreman went to the Pharaoh and pleaded with him. Please don't treat us like this. We are given no straw. But the slave drivers still demand, make bricks, make bricks. We are being beaten, but it's all your own people who are to blame. It's your own people who are to blame. But the Pharaoh shouted, silence. You're just filthy slack asses, the whole lot of you. That's why you keep crying to go and offer sacrifices to your Elohim. Well, boo-hoo. Now get back to work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still produce the full quota of bricks. Mm. And the Yisraelite foreman could see that they were in serious trouble by the number of bricks that was required of them. And as they left the Pharaoh's court, they confronted Musha and Aaron, who were waiting outside for them. We hope... Yahuwah punishes the crap out of you for making us an embarrassing stink in front of the Pharaoh and his council. He now has every reason to kill us. We hope Yahuwah punishes the crap out of you for making us an embarrassing stink in front of the Pharaoh and his council. He now has every reason to kill us. Then Musha returned to Yahusha and protested, My father, why have you brought all this trouble on your own people? Why did you even send me here? Ever since we went to the Pharaoh in your name, he's been even more evil and brutal to your people. And you've done jack all squat to, do, to deliver them. You've done jack all squat to deliver them. So what gives, man? What's the deal? Then Yahushua responded to Musha. Now watch what I do to the Pharaoh. Because when he feels the full force of my strong hand, he will release Yisrael. In fact, he'll beg them to leave. For I'm Yahuwah, remember? 
I appeared to Abraham, to Yitchak, and to Yaakov as the mighty Al Shaddai. And didn't they also know me as Yahuwah? I established my everlasting blood covenant of deliverance with them and promised to give them the land of Kenan, where they were living as foreigners. So you can be damn sure that I've heard the groans of my treasured people, Yisrael, who are now slaves to the Egyptians. And I'm well aware of my blood covenant with them. So go and say to the people that I am the almighty Yahuwah, who will deliver them out, of, out from under the burdens of the Egyptians' oppression and will rescue them from Egypt with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And I will bring them into the land I swore to give to Abraham, Yitzhak and Jacob, and will give it to you all as an inheritance. For I am Yahuwah Al Shaddai, the mighty Elohim of the mountain. So Yahuwah told the people, sorry, so Musha told the people of Israel what Yahusha had said, but they refused to listen anymore. They had become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. Fair enough. They're just looking at their lot in life, their hard work. But what about this big spiel? And this is the exciting thing about Exodus. There's big, long spiels by Yahusha everywhere. Big, lots of big sections of red writing. Only small bits and pieces here and there in Genesis where he appeared and said a few things. But here, there's pages and pages and huge sections of, of Yahushua speaking who he is. And uh, he's, he's not doubting anything, is he? He's like, you can be damn sure that I've heard. Don't you come questioning me, Musha. I know what I'm... I made this promise years and years ago. So, I made it to Abraham, you check, and Jacob, and now his children, and you are a, a descendant of them. I know what I'm doing, bro. Don't you worry. So say to the people that I am the Almighty Yahuwah who deliver them from under the burdens of the Egyptians' oppression and will rescue them from the Egypt with an outstretched arm. I love this. He's flexing his muscles, who he is, you know. Because this is another side of him. We didn't really see this side much in Genesis. This is Yahusha stretching his outstretched arm and flexing his muscles. It's wonderful. Are you reading this as though this is Yahushua talking to Musha? Or are you reading this as though Yahushua talking to you today? So, I mean, the context is he's talking to Musha, he's not talking to us. But he's the same, Elohim, he's the same Yahushua in our lives today. Do you go into your day with such confidence? Or are you Musha? Why did you even put me here? What's this about? Why did you give me this person? Why did you give me these children? Why did you give me this business? Why did you even put me on this earth? Mm. You know? Which character in this story are you? You know? Or are you Yahusha? Oh, don't you worry. Trusting in Yahusha, you know? Not to be Yahusha, but trusting in Yahusha's words. This is the same Yahusha that's talking to Musha that talks to us today. So we can be very confident. I am Yahuwah Al Shaddai. The mighty Yahuwah, Elohim of the mountain. That's what El Shaddai means, of the mountain. <clears throat> How many things went down on the mountain? So, where are we up to? Musha told the people what Yahushua said, that they weren't interested. They went back to work discouraged. Then Yahushua said to Musha, go back to the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and tell him to let the people of Israel leave his country. But master, Musha objected, my own people don't give a toss what I have to say anymore. So how can I expect the Pharaoh to take me seriously? I'm such an unconvincing, clumsy speaker. As if the mighty Pharaoh will ever listen to me. Oh, this is the text here where he says uncircumcised lips. I said it was the um, verse in the last episode, but it was right here. He says, I am uh, of uncircumcised lips. Musha used the phrase uncircumcised lips because he felt powerless, useless, and uninspired as the uncircumcised are. So Musha's objecting now. Don't I, my own people don't give a toss what I have to say. Why would Aaron listen to me? But Yahushua spoke to Musha and Aaron and gave them orders for the Israelites and for the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and commanded them to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. The truth is that the Israelite labour force was crucial to Egypt's future well-being. And by forcing the Israelites to gather their own straw to make the millions upon millions of mud bricks essential to Egypt's construction projects, 
the Pharaoh was only hurting himself. However, by this point, the spirit of Shatan had so overtaken Pharaoh that he didn't care anymore. His only objection was to harass and hurt the people of Israel. Ordering them to make bricks without giving them the proper requirements to make the bricks is just shooting himself in the foot, isn't it? If you're trying to advance the structure of your own capital, of your nation, the buildings, the, everything that's going on, they're taking, going to take a lot, a lot longer. And whipping them and beating them for not doing it is still not going to get you any further along in your projects. Uh, so, so, doing this, forcing the Israelites to gather their own straw to make millions upon millions of mud bricks central to Israel's country. The Pharaoh was only hurting himself, but Shatan had entered him so much that he didn't care anymore. His only objection was to harass and hurt the people of Yisrael. Then right in the middle of this, we had a little spiel, which I've turned into a chart for you, as I do, uh, on the lineage of Louis. These are the heads. These are the heads of the fathers of the Lewin, according to their clans. There was a theory bouncing around, which I didn't include in this because I, I didn't really buy it. There were a lot of people uh, on one of the places I went that was saying, how... Could, for instance, how could Aaron just leave and go and meet Musha in the wilderness? How could all these things be going on? And uh, they're meeting and having these discussions. I thought they were out there making bricks and being whipped. And how are they having these discussions? And, you know, Aaron just wanders off into the wilderness to go and meet his brother. How does this all happen? I thought they were slaves. If he can wander off, why can't they all? Um, and the theory was, and there was a line, a line I think, mentioned in Yasher about it, that... Um, the tribe of Louis were already considered priesthood at this point. And the priesthood, um, uh, as with the nations, the priesthood was held at a higher standard. So their priesthood wasn't given the same day-to-day slavery type work that the rest of the nation was given. I didn't include this because I thought about it a lot and I thought, there's nowhere written anywhere that um, this nation was anything. To, why were they? Cho- that was the thing. That was it. Why were they chosen to be the priesthood? Why was Louis chosen to be the priesthood? There's nothing special about that tribe. In fact, that tribe was cursed in a sense because uh, what were their names? Shimeon slept with his father's wife, and then there was no, that was Raven. Raven slept with his father's wife, and then Shimeon and Louis went on the bloodbath. Remember? So those two sons were just like. Yaakov was just like, I'm, I'm just ready to die. I don't even want to know what you get up to. So those two left with nothing. They were almost cursed. So um, why, would the, why would that tribe be chosen as to be lifted up as a priesthood? The only time they're chosen to do that is later on in the wilderness after the golden calf incident when, when they rally around their fellow brother, Musha, who was from the same tribe, and repent and make it right. And so Yahushua decides to spare their lives and make them the priesthood. Um, That's when that happens at Sinai. So any evidence of them being any kind of priesthood uh, in Egypt, I just couldn't couldn't, uh, take that serious enough. There there was one line mentioned in Yasha, but Yasha is not fully accurate in everything. So I um, wasn't in that because I just thought, no, they weren't made priesthood back in Egypt. You know, so... How some of them got to wander around at times, who knows? But um, interesting enough, right here, Louis has given a, a lineage. So look at this picture here. You've got Louis. Then we have Gershon, and then you, the tribe, the um, the line, that very faint line I'm sending down here through Kehath, Amram, and then we had Aaron, Miriam, and Musha in the middle there. Musha had Gershon and Eleazar. And Aaron had Alazar and Phinecus. And these were the, these were the, after Aaron anyway, who was the first high priest, his sons, they were the high, the high priests after him. So these are the heads of the fathers of Loom, according to their clans. Why did you who should decide to mention this to us now? Who knows? But he decided to mention it right in the middle of this text here. Probably because both Musha and Aaron are Louis, Lou White. From the tribe of Louis. So, anyway, enough of that. I don't think there's enough water to support information to support that they were priesthood or any standing out as anything special while I was still in Egypt. Because it's pretty obvious that the Mount Sinai 
that's when they were made, the priesthood. So I've decided to stand on that because that's what the word says. Musha's staff becomes a serpent. Then Yahushua reassured Musha, so why did he have to reassure him? Let's go back up. What's happened? Yahushua spoke to Musha. Okay, they're discouraged. People are discouraged. The chief, the, the people are discouraged. No one believes anymore. Musha's like, why did you even do this? I can't even speak properly. Yahushua spoke to Musha and Aaron and gave them orders for the Yishalites and the Pharaoh the king of Egypt. Leave the people out of Yisrael. So then Yahushua reassured Musha saying, Check out what I'm going to do next, my son. The Pharaoh is so obsessed with his stupid deities. So I will make you seem like an Elohim to him. And your brother Aaron will be like your prophet. He's clever, isn't he? They're so into these idols and stuff. I'll make you like one of them. They're so into worshipping idols. I'll, they're so into worshipping deities. I will make you a deity. I will make you look like a deity to him. You will seem like an Elohim to him and your brother Aaron will be like your prophet. So tell Aaron everything I command you and Aaron must command the Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his land. But stop being discouraged, my son, because I fully intend to make the Pharaoh's heart stubborn and hard so I can do stacks more, mir stacks more miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. But even then the Pharaoh won't listen to you. So I'll blast Egypt with the full might of my fist and rescue my people, the children of Israel, out from the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. And then the Egyptians will know that I am the only Elohim, Yahuwah. So he's basically saying to Musha, as he said back when he was in the wilderness at the burning bush, I'm going to harden the Pharaoh's heart. He's already a ruthless bastard. I'm going to and Satan's already taking him over. I'm going to harden his heart more because I don't want it to be easy. I want you all to see what I'm capable of. I want you all to see who this great being that you're about to follow and trust in and believe can do. Who is it? What is it about? What this being? What I'm about? So, Yahushua uses this experience of Egyptian slavery to abolish the idea of there being many deities. Polytheism and establishes himself as the only living Elohim, monotheism. Idol worship is a huge deal and a huge offence to him. It may not have looked that way in the book of Genesis, Barashis, where we came from, but in this book, he's explaining and standing up and saying, this is how I feel about the way you're worshipping, and all. I'm not sharing my esteem. I'm a very jealous Elohim. I'm not going to share you with anybody else. Who would? I created you. And I created the gold, the silver, the wood, the stone, the clay, all this rubbish you're worshipping. Instead of worshipping me, you're worshipping the sun. I put the sun there. So, you know? Ridiculous. So Musha and Aaron did just as Yahushua had commanded them. And Musha was 80 years ago. Musha was 80 years old. And Aaron 83 when they challenged the Pharaoh of Egypt. Charlton Heston didn't look 83, did he? So Musha was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they challenged the Pharaoh of Egypt. And Yahushua said to Musha and Aaron, the Pharaoh will push back straight away, saying, show me a miracle. So when he does, say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down in front of the Pharaoh and it will become a serpent. So Musha and Aaron went to the courts of the Pharaoh and did what Yahushua had commanded them. Aaron threw down the staff before the Pharaoh and command da, 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 Aaron threw down the staff for the Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a serpent. Then the Pharaoh called in his own sorcerers, those who practiced divination and witchcraft, and they did the same thing with their magic. They threw down their staffs, and they became serpents too. But then Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs, and the Pharaoh's heart remained hard, and he refused to listen to them, just as Yahushua had said he would. I just look at that and think, how discouraged would you be? I mean, maybe they weren't. Maybe they were used to this kind of sorcery and witchcraft. I mean, in today's world, if somebody threw down a stick on the ground and turned into a, in a, a snake, that's something you have to go to magic tricks for, and even then, most of the time it's fake. I mean, if somebody can do that real sorcery in front of you, which is all from Satan and unclean spirits, um, but they're pretty powerful too. If somebody did that in front of you, you'd be like, oh, whoops. I thought I had a good trick here. 
No, they did the same thing. But it wasn't about Musha or Aaron. It was about what Yahushua was doing. So what did Yahushua's snake do to their snake? Ate them. So even though they could do the same thing, one snake ate the other snake. And the Pharaoh's heart remained hard. Yeah, let's start, God. Let's start the plagues. I put a chart in there, but it's, uh, we don't need to go into that. I'm not going to focus so much effort and time on all the pagan idols of Egypt. If you're fascinated by this subject, you can go and look them up and research. There's squillions of videos you can watch and research you can do on all the on the depth of what Yahushua was actually uh, proving in Egypt. Every single plague was uh, attacking a certain idol. And remember, the idol, as I said last episode, had no power. So it's not like he, it's not like Yahushua had taken it personally and he was on a rampage against an idol. No, he wasn't against the idol itself. He was against the mindset. He was winning back the confidence and the worship of his people. And he wanted it to be the whole world, but at least his people, he wanted, he wanted to prove to them that this thing sitting there that they're worshiping is useless, powerless, and I'm gonna destroy it. So, break down its reputation, you know what I'm saying? He wasn't worried about the idol itself because idols aren't real. Idols don't exist. The power behind them. It's just an unclean spirit tricking people. So that's why, you know, having an idol in your home like a, a, a golden a statue or something like that, who cares? It's got no power of itself if it's just something that you've decided to put there because it looks good with your lounge or your, your lamp or whatever. Whatever. It's not, unless you're bound down to it and worshipping it. It's not an idol. An idol is actually a spirit that's convincing you to behave a certain way. So let's go into the plagues. Here we go. Pharaoh's heart's hardened. They've just had the, the witness of the, uh, the snake. He threw the serpent, the, threw the staff down, the snake, turned into a snake, and the soothsayers and witches did the same thing. So Pharaoh's like, oh, okay, that's a good parlor trick. I, we can do that too. I got off. So. Here we go, plague number one. Yahusha wages war against Egypt's river deity, Hapi. The Nile River, as we discussed earlier when Musha was born, the Nile River was an Egyptian deity believed to be the source of all life in Egypt. So the people really depended on the Nile, not, not just for their livelihood, but they believed that it had power it was a deity the water the river was a deity in itself they worshipped it so the plague of blood Yahushua said to Musha as I told you the Pharaoh the Pharaoh's heart is hard and he still refuses to let my people go so go down to the river and surprise the Pharaoh in the morning while he's worshipping his river deity stand on the bank and make sure you take that rod Make sure you take the rod that turned into a serpent. Then put this on him. Yahuwah, the Elohim of Yisrael, has sent me to you. And he says, Pharaoh, release my people at once so they can serve and follow me in the wilderness. Until now, you have refused to listen. So I'll show you that I'm the only living Elohim, Yahuwah. I will strike the waters of the Nile and turn it into blood. The fish will die and the river will stink and your people won't be able to drink any water from the Nile. Then tell Aaron to take your staff and raise it over the waters of Egypt, all its rivers, streams, ponds, and all the reservoirs, so that all the waters turn to blood. Yes, there will be lots of blood. Even all the water stored in wooden bowls and stone pots will be turned to blood. That's a big deal because this whole, so far our journey in the blood covenant is all about blood, remember? There's power in the blood, Yahushua. Blood means a lot to Yahushua. The blood of all the dead mankind cries out to him. You can hear the frequency of the blood. So, Musha and Aaron did just as Yahushua had commanded them. And as the Pharaoh and all of his crones looked on, totally gobsmacked, Aaron raised up his rod and struck the water of the Nile and the whole river turned to blood. The fish in the river died and the water became so disgusting that the Egyptians couldn't drink it. There was blood everywhere throughout the whole land of Egypt. And when the Egyptians came to drink and draw water, they looked into their pitchers and behold, all the water was turned into blood. 
And when they came to drink from their cup, the water in the cup became blood. And when a woman kneaded her dough and cooked the food, its appearance looked red from the blood. Even all the things she was baking were red because of the, the water which had turned to blood. But again, the magicians of Egypt used their magic and they too turned waters into blood. So again, I bet they couldn't do it in the whole nation though. But again, the magicians of Egypt used their magic and they too turned the waters into blood. So again, the Pharaoh's heart remained hardened and he refused to listen to Musha and Aaron, just as Yahusha had said he would. In fact, the Pharaoh found the whole incident quite ho-hum. And returning to his palace, he put the whole thing out of his mind. Then all the Egyptians dug along the riverbank to find drinking water because they couldn't drink the water from the Nile itself. And seven days passed from the time Yahusha struck the Nile. So that's the first deity he's gone at, gone after. The river, the river god. Number two, Yahusha wages war against Egyptian Egypt's Egypt's frog deity, frog-headed deity, Hect, Hect, there it's called. Plague of frogs. Then Yahushua said to Musha, go back to the Pharaoh and announce to him, this is what Yahuwah, the only living Elohim says, let my people go so they can come and serve me. And if you dare refuse, I will dish you up a mighty plague of frogs all across the entire land. The Nile River will swarm with frogs and they'll come out of the, up out of the river and into your palace, even in your bedroom and onto your bed. They'll enter the houses of your officials and all your people. They will even jump into your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frogs will jump on you, your people, and all your servants. Then tell Aaron to stretch out your shepherd's rod over all the rivers, canals, and ponds of Egypt and usher in the frogs all over the land. Amazing, isn't it? So Aaron raised up Musha's rod over the waters of Egypt and frogs came up and covered the whole land. And when the Egyptians drank, their bellies were filled with frogs and they danced in their bellies as they do when in the river. And all their drinking water and cooking water turned to frogs. Also, when they lay in their beds, their perspiration bred more frogs. These bits aren't written in the canon, it's in the Asher, but I found it fascinating. I mean, you believe this? Oh, that's a bit extreme, perspiration turning into frogs. Isn't this whole story extreme? Isn't this, isn't, aren't all these judgments extreme? That's the whole point. You should can do anything. But the magicians were unable, sorry, the magicians were able to do the same thing with their magic. Oh yeah, were they? What, create frogs? They too caused frogs to come up out of the land of Egypt. Then the Pharaoh called for Musha and Aaron and begged them, ask you who are to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will release your people so they can offer sacrifices to you who are in the wilderness. And when would you like this to happen, said Musha? Give me a time and we'll be there, and the frogs will stay in the river Nile for good. You give me a time and we'll be there. Damn it, do it tomorrow, the Pharaoh barked. All righty, will do. And you will know, O oh great Pharaoh, that there is no other Elohim like Yahuwah. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials and your people, and they will remain only in the Nile River. And Yahusha did just what Musha had said. And the frogs in the houses, the courtyards, and in the fields all died, and the Egyptians piled them into great heaps, and a terrible stench filled the entire land. But when the Pharaoh saw that relief had come, he became stubborn and hard-hearted again, refusing to listen to Musha and Aaron, just as Yahushua had said. So through all this, Musha's getting more confident. You can see in the way he's talking, he's getting more, he's gaining control over himself as far as his unbelief. He's starting to believe this voice that's talking to him. He's starting to trust in his Mashiach, trust in his deliverer, and act, because what he says is happening. See, it's like, Yahushua's telling him what to do, but then Yahushua's backing him up and making it happen when he says it, or when Aaron says it. So they're, they're building trust between each other, Musha and Yahushua. Musha and Yahushua and Musha and Yahushua. 
Number three, plague number three, Yahusha wages war against Egypt's earth deity, Geb. Geb, the plague of gnats. So Yahusha said to Musha, tell Aaron to raise your rod and strike the dust of the ground and the dust will turn into swarms of gnats. That's like lice today, head lice, throughout the land of Egypt. So Musha and Aaron did what Yahushua commanded them. And when Aaron raised his hand and struck the dust of the ground with the rod, gnats, lice, infested the entire land, covering all the Egyptians by almost a metre high. Oh, that's a bit extreme, having lice a metre high. That's a bit silly, Mark. You can't just write that just because Yasha says it. I've done it. What are you going to do? A metre high. Struck the ground with rod nets, infested the entire land, covering the Egyptians by almost a metre high. All the dust in the land of Egypt turned into gnats and infested the flesh of both man and beast. In all the Egyptians and also the Pharaoh and his queen. And Egypt was in a state of panic. The Pharaoh's magicians tried to do the same thing with their dark magic, but they failed. <laughs> they failed. And the gnats covered everyone, people and animals alike. The Pharaoh was furious with his sorcerers, but they couldn't help him. This is the finger of the living Elohim himself, they said. But the Pharaoh's heart was rock hard in unbelief, and he wouldn't listen to them, just as Yahushua had said. Number four, Yahushua wages war against Egypt's sun deity, Kipri. And it, it could be other deities and other names as well. You can look into it yourself, but this is just to basically remind us that he's having a go. Basically taking the piss of these uh, deities that people are worshipping. You're worshipping that? Look what I'm about to do to your deity. You know, come and worship me. I'm the real Elohim. The plague of flies. So Yahushua told me, you should get up early in the morning and stand right in the Pharaoh's way. Stand right in his way. As he goes down to the river to worship his pathetic dummy water idol. Say to him, are you daft, hard of hearing or just stupid? Are you daft, hard of hearing or just stupid? Yahushua says, let my people go. So they can come and serve me. And if you won't give in, I will send swarms of flies on you. Your servants, your people and all your houses. The Egyptian homes will be filled with flies and the ground will be covered with them. But I will spare the land of Goshen, where my people Israel live. No flies will be found there. And you will know that I, Yahuwah, am right here in the heart of your land. That's the whole key here. I, Yahuwah, am here in the heart of your land. Can't you tell? And I will make a clear distinction. I will make a clear distinction between my people and your people. So get your beauty sleep, Pharaoh, because this great sign will happen smack bang tomorrow. He's making a distinction between his people, Pharaoh's people, and his people. He's making a distinction between Yisrael and Egypt. That's the whole purpose. I'm with Yisrael and look at the protection. I ain't with you, you under my wrath, and look what's happening to you. Is that happening in the world today? It's going to become more and more prominent. People do, oh, that's just a coincidence. That's just a natural disaster, you know. It's going to become more and more obvious as it comes to the end that there are people that are, have a protection over their house. He's making a great distinction between Israel and the nations. And Yahushua did just that. A thick swarm of flies filled the Pharaoh's palace and the houses of his servants. The whole land of Egypt was thrown into chaos and ruined by all the flies. And we can't even stand one fly in this house buzzing around their heads, you know, running around with a napkin or a fly spray or hitting, hitting them and they look like idiots flying. Imagine this, swarms and swarms in your house, going up your nose and in your ears and... Ooh, a thick swarm of flies filled the Pharaoh's palace and the house of his servants. The whole land of Egypt was thrown into chaos and ruined by the flies. And Yahushua sent all kinds of beasts of the field into Egypt. And they came and destroyed all of Egypt, man and beast and trees and all the things that were in Egypt. And Yahushua sent fiery serpents, scorpions, mice, weasels, toads, together with other creeping in the dust. He sent flies, hornets, fleas, bugs, gnats, each swarming according to their kind according to their kind, so just like in creation, all according to their kind. And all reptiles and winged animals came to Egypt and tormented the Egyptians day and night. And the fleas and flies came into their eyes and in their ears 
and the hornets came and stung them, driving them into their inner rooms. Right, this, this is just embellishing on the text. This is from the Book of Yasha. It's amazing. And this is a good one. The Sulanuth. Have you ever heard of the Sulanuth? I couldn't. This is the one and only picture I could find. Someone had guessed what the Sulanuth looked like. What's the Sulanuth, Mark? This is the Sulanuth. Come with me, I'll show you what the Sulanuth is. And when the Egyptians hid themselves because of the swarms of animals, they locked their doors behind them. Then Yahusha ordered the Sulanuth the sea creature which was in the river, to come up into Egypt. And she had long arms, five metres long. That's as long as an average bedroom, bigger. And she climbed onto their roofs and uncovered the rafting and flooring and cut them and stretched her arms into the house and removed the lock and the bolt and opened the houses of Egypt. And afterwards, the swarms of animals went into the houses of Egypt, destroyed the Egyptians, devouring and completely devastating them. That's a bit extreme, Mark. I think you should have put that story in the extreme pile. What are we here, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter? That's a bit mystical and wacky, this one. So, Yahushua can do anything, can't he? Seems feasible to me, the Sulanu, I loved it, wonderful. It took me ages, looking and looking and looking and that, and there's so, so many people saying that that's not, that's not true, he couldn't have done that, it's not true, it's make-believe. A creature crawl, climbing up onto the roofs with five metre long arms and, you know, where, well, why have they never seen it again? And like, you wish you can do anything. I don't care. I've written it. It's amazing. Because it, it shows me that even though the Egyptians thought they could dig holes and go into their cellars and their basements and hide under the raftings and, you know, shut their doors and keep out, keep a lot of it out. So you should just sent the Sulanuth in to rip open the doors and the thing, and then they all the bugs and everything flew in again. So you can't get away from the plagues. You know, like people are digging deep underground military bases under the earth, hundreds and hundreds of meters and kilometers under the earth. Technology is running rampant under there. Area Fifty One, all this stuff. The elite of the earth are preparing for the end of the world. Well, what are they going to do when the Sulanuth comes? It won't be a stool, it'll be the reapers. Reapers will just go down your shaft, mate, and then open the doors and the fire will get in. You know, like, it's, it's ridiculous. You can't escape Yahushua's judgment. That's why I thought this was fantastic. The Sulanuth. So I don't have any video footage, sorry, of the Sulanuth. I couldn't find it anywhere. That's the only picture I could find. So the Pharaoh called for Musha and Aaron. All right, stop this torture at once. Go and offer sacrifices to your wretched Elohim, but stay here and do it in this land. And Musha replied, forget it. The Egyptians despise the sacrifices we offer to our Elohim, Yahuwah. You know very well that if we offer our sacrifices here, where the Egyptians can see us, they will stone us to death. Why? We must take a three-day trip into the wilderness to offer our sacrifices to our Elohim. You are just as he's commanded us. Why would the Egyptians stone them? Look here. Ox and cattle were considered divine. The Egyptians, especially bulls. And if they saw Yishra sacrificing them, they would be infuriated. And they're the master race at this point. So they just, they just come and, you know, rip them a new one. You can't go killing bulls and stuff. We're worshipping those sacred animals. So Musha's going, no way, we're not doing it in this land because uh, we'll, we'll be stoned by the Egyptians. We can't sacrifice our animals in front of you guys. Fine, for goodness sake, go, the Pharaoh yelled. But I'll let you go into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to your Elohim. But don't think for a second that you're going too far away. Now hurry and get rid of all these blasted plagues. And Musha answered, as soon as I leave you, I'll speak to Yahuwah. And tomorrow the swarms of flies will disappear from you and your servants and all your people. But I'm warning you, Pharaoh, don't play games with us and lie again or turn your nose up at us leaving. So Musha left the Pharaoh's palace and asked Yahushua to remove all the flies. And Yahushua did as Musha asked and caused the swarms of flies to disappear from the Pharaoh, his servants and his people. Not a single fly remained. But of course, the wicked Pharaoh's heart remained stubborn and hard again. And he refused to let Yishuel go. So we have number five. 
who shall wage his war against Egypt's bull-headed fertility deity Hathor or Apis? Apis. Apis bull. The Apis bull is what they fashioned the uh, the uh, golden calf in the wilderness. Uh, the image of that. This is what they were worshiping. The bull. This image. Dead livestock. So Yahushua said, go back to the Pharaoh again and tell him, this is what Yahuwah the Elohim of the Hebrews says, release my people from your stupidity so they can serve me in the wilderness. If you keep holding them and refuse to let them go, I will strike all of your livestock, your horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep and goats with a deadly plague. And I will again make a distinction between the livestock of the Israelites and those of the Egyptians. Not a single one of Yishra's animals will die. I have already set the time for this plague to begin. So brace yourself, O great Pharaoh, because it's happening tomorrow. And Yahushua did just as he said. The next morning, all the livestock of the Egyptians were dead. But Yisrael didn't lose a single animal. The Pharaoh sent his officials to investigate and they discovered that Yisrael had not lost any livestock. But despite this, the Pharaoh's heart remained stubborn and he still refused to release his Yisraelite slave force. And that would have been a big deal, having all your livestock. What did they say the livestock was? Horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep and goats, all dead. That's a big part of your transportation, uh, workforce and uh, food and they worship them as well, a lot of those. So, yeah, that was a that would have been a big deal. This was the first thing that involved death, as far as people things is showing up turning up dead. So number six, Pharaoh's still not convinced. Hard-hearted, Yahushua wages war against Egypt's health and healing deities Isis and Imhotep. The plague of boils. Boils are just like a big red uh, lump that turns into a big blister and then you know it, the head falls off like a blood blister and the, the head falls off the, the top falls off it if it pops and you've just got this gaping wound remember job Job was scraping the pus out of his out of his boils out of his wounds with the clay pots this is what boils are big big bloody blisters then Yahushua said to musha and aaron take handfuls of ashes from the furnace and have Musha toss it into the air while the Pharaoh watches. And the ashes will spread like fine dust over the whole land of Egypt, causing festering boils to break out on people and animals throughout the land. So they took the soot from the brick furnace and stood before the Pharaoh. And Musha threw all the ash into the air and boils broke out on all the people and animals alike. The burning inflammation in the flesh of the Egyptians burst their skin and it became a severe itch from the soles of their feet to the crown of their heads and so many boils were in their skin that their flesh wasted away until they became rotten and putrid imagine the smell in the land rotten flesh they didn't have penicillin or the antibiotics we have today they had herbs and stuff but this was a full-on plague Even the magicians were unable to stand before Musha because the boils had broken out on them and all the Egyptians too. But Yahushua hardened the Pharaoh's heart and just as he told Musha, the Pharaoh refused to listen. So you can see that Yahushua's behind this and we think, well, why didn't, why, why, why didn't he just, just get over this, will you? Can we just, just get him out of there? No, he wanted to do it this way so that they had something to remember. They had a point of reference, something seared into their memories to tell their children that would spread across the globe of what he did to the most powerful nation on the earth who uh, questioned him, who stood him in his face and, you know, mocked him, disobeyed him. Number seven, Yahushua wages war against the Egypt's sky and air deities, Nut and Shu. Like I said, it could be other ones too. The plague of hail. Then Yahushua said to Musha, get up early in the morning and stand before the Pharaoh. Tell him, this is what Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel, says. 
Let my people go so they can follow me in the wilderness. And if you don't, I will send more plagues on you, your servants, officials, and your people. Then you will know that there is no one like me in all the earth. By now I could have lifted my hand and struck you and your people with a plague to wipe you off the face of the earth. But I've spared you for a purpose, to show you why, to show you my power and to spread my name throughout the earth. There's your answer. Why didn't he just wipe them out and get his people out? Because he's done it this way for a purpose, to show you my power and spread my name throughout the earth. But you still lift yourself up over my people and refuse to release them. So tomorrow at this time, I will send a hailstorm more devastating than any in all the history of Egypt. Quick, O oh mighty Pharaoh, order your livestock and servants to come in from the fields to find shelter, because any person or animal left outside will die when the, when the hail falls. And some of the Pharaoh's officials were afraid because of what Yahushua had said. They quickly brought their servants and livestock in from the fields. But those who paid no attention to the words of Yahushua left theirs out in the open fields. Then Yahushua said to Musha, lift your hand towards the sky, so hail may fall on the people, the livestock and all the plants throughout the land of Egypt. This is all happening through Musha, remember? He's, he's building confidence in Musha to his voice, and he's building confidence in the people to Musha. He's laying a groundwork here of what he wants to do so that they will trust each other and mainly trust him. So Musha lifted his staff towards the sky and Yahushua sent a tremendous hailstorm against the land of Egypt. And never in all the history of Egypt had there been a storm like it with such devastating hail and continuous lightning that left all of Egypt in ruins. The hail struck down everything in the open fields the people, animals, and plants alike. Even the trees were destroyed. All the flax and barley were ruined by the hail because the barley had formed heads and the flax was budding. But the wheat and the spelt were spared because they had not yet sprouted from the ground. And the only place without hail was the region of Goshen, where the people of Israel lived. The hail struck their vines and broke their fruit trees and dried them up and every green herb became dry and perished, for a mingling fire was in the centre of each hailstone. Each hailstone had fire in the middle of it that burned. Therefore the hail and fire consumed all things. All men and beasts that were outside died because of the flames of fire and of the hail. Then the Pharaoh quickly summoned Musha and Aaron, I can see how my wickedness and evil has brought this upon my people. Yahuwah is upright and good, and my people and I are wrong. Please beg you who are to end this terrifying thunder and hail. We've had enough. I will let you go. You don't need to stay any longer. All right then, Musha replied. As soon as I leave the city, I will lift my hand to the thunder and hail. I will lift my hand, hands and the thunder and hail will stop. And you will know that the earth belongs to our mighty Elohim Yahuwah. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear him yet. So Musha left the Pharaoh's court and went out of the city. And when he lifted his hands to Yahushua, the thunder and hail stopped and the pelting rain ceased. But when the Pharaoh saw that the rain, hail and thunder had stopped, the wickedness and fury of he and his officials returned. And hardening his heart again, he refused to let the people leave, just as Yahushua had told Musha. Then Yahushua said to Musha, Return to the Pharaoh and make your demands again, for I have made him and his officials incredibly pig-headed and stubborn, so I can display my miraculous signs among them, and so that you can tell your children and grandchildren about how I made a mockery of the most powerful nation on earth, and about the wonders I displayed among them. And you'll know that I am Yahuwah. This is his purpose. This goes in the face of anybody who says, why didn't he just, this is the answer. Why didn't he just make it simple? This is, he illustrated all the way he did so that he could display his miraculous signs among them and so that their children and grandchildren would know what a mockery he made of Egypt.
Number eight, Yahushua wages war against Egypt's grain deities, Nipah and Hepri, locusts. So Musha and Aaron went to the Pharaoh and said, Yahuwa our Elohim says to you, O Pharaoh, haven't you had enough bitch slapping yet? How long will you refuse to surrender? Let my people go, they're mine and I want them back. But if you refuse, watch out. For tomorrow I'll bring a swarm of locusts on your country and they'll cover the whole land so that you won't be able to see the ground. They will devour what little is left of your crops after the hailstorm, including all the trees growing in the field, and will overrun your palaces and the homes of your officials and all the houses in Egypt. Never in the history of Egypt have your ancestors seen a plague like this one. And with that, Musha turned and left the Pharaoh and his officials ran to him. His officials ran to him and appealed to him. Mighty Pharaoh, would you please just release the Hebrews and let them go so that this suffering will stop? Can't you see that our whole country is in ruins? So that, they can't even understand it now either. Are you, are you daft? Are you stupid? Let him go. Our land is in ruins. So Musha and Aaron were brought back to the Pharaoh. All right, he told them. Go and serve you who are your Elohim. But who exactly will be going with you? And Musha replied, everyone, young and old, sons and daughters, flocks and herds, we must all join together in celebrating a festival to Yahuwah. And the Pharaoh said, you'll need Yahuwah to protect you if you dare take all the children too. I can see through your devious evil plans and you can forget it. No way, never. Only the men can go and serve Yahuwah since that's what you first requested. And he booted Musha and Aaron out of the palace. So Musha said to so Yehusha. So Yehusha said to Musha, raise your hand over the land of Egypt to bring on the locusts. Let them cover the land and devour every plant that survived the hailstorm. So Musha raised his staff over Egypt, and Yehusha caused an east wind to blow over the land all that day and through the night. And when morning arrived, the east wind had brought all the species of locusts. And they swarmed over the whole land of Egypt, settling in dense swarms from one end of the country to the other. It was the worst locust plague in Egyptian history, and there has never been another one like it. And so many locusts covered the whole country that the land was darkened from them, for they blocked out a lot of the sunlight. Imagine that so much that you can't even see through the sky through the sun. They devoured every plant in the fields and all the and all the fruit on the trees that had survived the hailstorm. Not a single leaf was left on the trees and plants throughout the land of Egypt. The Pharaoh quickly summoned Musha and Aaron. My wicked behaviour is an offence to your Elohim Yahuwah and against you. Please forgive me just this once, just this once, and plead with Yahuwah your Elohim to take away this death from me. So Musha left the Pharaoh's court. Meanwhile, the Egyptians rejoiced at the locusts because even though they had destroyed all the produce of the fields, they caught them in abundance and salted them. <laughs> they caught them all, dried them all out and salted them up for their food. So Yahushua turned a mighty wind of the sea which took away all the locusts, even those that were salted, and thrust them into the Red Sea and not one locust remained within the boundaries of Egypt. They thought they'd be cunning and smart. Uh -huh, we've cooked them up and we've uh, salted them. We're going to eat them. Thanks, mate. It's our food. So what do you do? Blew them all away. No more food. But Yahushua hardened the Pharaoh's heart again. Oh, this Pharaoh. Yahushua hardened the heart of the Pharaoh again. So they, he refused to release Israel. So remember, he's breaking down the, the strongholds, breaking down the mindsets of the nation, of the world, really. But mainly of his people, breaking down the mindsets that these deities were protecting them. The deities were protecting the waters, so he turned them to blood. The deities were protecting the livestock, so he killed them. Deities were protecting the crops, so locusts came and ate them all. Everything that the deities were so apparently protecting in their nation, Yahushua just wiped out. So where's the power of the deity now? He's showing them that the deities, that religion, that idolatry, is dead. There's no, there's no power behind it. It's a lie. Religion is a lie. Idolatry is a lie. So there's no power in it. Despite what they say, it's a lie. There's no power there. So we have 
What is it now? Number nine. Who shall wage his war against Egypt's great deity Ra? Have all watched enough movies where you know that deity? The deity Ra. The plague of darkness. Then Yahusha said to Musha, lift your hand towards the sky and the land of Egypt will be covered with a darkness so thick you can feel it. This was interesting. So thick you can feel it. How can darkness be so thick that you can feel it? How can darkness be so thick that you can feel it? So Musha lifted his hand to the sky and a deep darkness covered the entire land of Egypt for three days. And during this time, the people couldn't even see each other and no one dared move. But there was sunlight as usual in Goshen, where the people of Israel lived. Finally, the Pharaoh called for Musha, for goodness sake, bugger off, I'm done with this madness. Go and serve your Elohim, he said. You may take your little ones with you, but leave all your flocks and herds here. No, Musha said. Don't you get it yet? We're taking the animals for sacrifices to you who are our Elohim. All our livestock are going with us and not a hoof will be left behind. And Yahushua hardened the Pharaoh's heart once more and he saw red and took back his offer. Get the hell out of here, you relentless bastard. The Pharaoh screamed at Musha and don't dare step foot in this palace again for the day you see my face again will be your last. Oh, your damn skippy. You're damn right, Musha replied. I'll be, I won't be seeing your face ever again, oh mighty Pharaoh. How about that? What about the dialogue going on here? Don't dare step foot in this palace again. The day you see my face will be your last. Oh, you're damn skippy it will be. Oh, you'll be the last day ever, mate. You were right, right as rain. I won't be seeing you again. This was interesting. Uh, regarding the darkness. Someone suffering from a dark, deep, suicidal type depression is experiencing the same thick spiritual darkness that covered Egypt. A darkness caused by a lack of Yahushua's favour or his light. A darkness caused by unclean spirits and evil behaviour. It wasn't just that they couldn't physically see each other or make out their surroundings. They were completely overwhelmed by this dark atmosphere of impending doom, from which there was no escape. But while Egypt was wallowing in terror, Yisrael was celebrating. Very interesting. That's the world that we live in today. I mean, we can see each other, but we can't see. They can't out there. They can't see. They're dark. It's darkened. I'm going to read that again. I thought that was fascinating. Somebody had said that in my, in my searching, studying, I forget who it was. Someone suffering from a dark, deep suicidal depression is experiencing the same thick spiritual darkness that covered Egypt. Egypt had a physical darkness and a spiritual darkness. Today, it, there's a darkness over the world. The world is dark without Yahushua's favour. A darkness caused by a lack of Yahushua's favour. A darkness caused by unclean spirits and evil behaviour. It wasn't just that they couldn't physically see each other or make out their surroundings. They were completely overwhelmed by this dark atmosphere of impending doom from which there was no escape. But while Egypt was wallowing in terror, Israel was celebrating. This is the same darkness without form and void darkness that was on the earth before Yahushua brought his essence into the world and created his marriage home. Anyone who goes against Yahushua, anyone outside of his covenant, anyone being disobedient, anyone off the path outside of his protection, anyone outside in the world, the nations, are in the darkness. It's best if you face it. If you're talking to, if you're talking to anybody out there, dealing with anybody, the butcher, the baker, the bank manager, anybody, they're all dark, darkened. They're in the darkness. So if Yahushua's not knocking on their heads and drawing them. Just deal as you need to deal. Wheel and deal, trade. Get what you need from people. Have relationships, whatever, but don't expect anything. Don't try and reach people unless Yahushua's reaching them. Yahushua has, is the only person. Yahushua's light is the only one 
He's the only one who can wake someone up. We can't wake people up. This was interesting too. Just as Egypt was submerged in darkness while the Passover lambs were being prepared. So this is happening in Egypt. We haven't got to the lambs yet, but this is happening at the same time the lambs were being prepared. Just as Egypt was submerged in darkness while the Passover lambs were being prepared, Yahushua, the firstborn Passover lamb, who legally took away the evil of the world, was dying on a torture stake, and the whole land suddenly fell into a thick, horrifying darkness. Yes, darkness came before Yisrael's great deliverance, and today the world is also filled with a heavy, thick darkness of evil. However, Yahushua's bride is rejoicing in anticipation for her bridegroom's return and her final deliverance when the sun goes dark and the moon glows blood red. So darkness in Egypt, darkness in Jerusalem when, when Yahushua was being impaled and darkness today before our great deliverance today, before Yahushua comes back. There's darkness, you know, symbolic, metaphoric darkness, spiritual darkness in the earth right now. So... Plague number 10. We'll finish on this, guys. We've gone for a while today. So the whole uh, nation is in darkness, except Goshen. And then Yahushua waged his war against all any deities that were left over. All Egyptian deities. All Egyptian deities, including the divinity of the Pharaoh himself. Because remember, the Pharaoh was considered to be a deity as well. They worshipped him as a god too. So... Death of the firstborn. Yahushua said to Musha, I will strike that wretched Pharaoh and the land of Egypt with one more fatal plague. And after that, the Pharaoh will let you leave this country. In fact, he will force you all to leave. Tell all the Israelite men and women to ask their Egyptian neighbors for articles of silver and gold. Yahushua had caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the people of Israel and Musha. Musha was considered a very great man in the land of Egypt, respected by the Pharaoh's officials and the Egyptian people alike. Would, of course you would be. They respected him now because all the plagues followed what he said. Yahushua told him what to say. And him and Aaron went ahead and said it and Yahushua backed them up by making it happen. So their words were trustworthy and they had a good reputation. And the people feared them. So did the Egyptians. And before Musha left the courts of the Pharaoh for the last time, he had announced, this was before they yelled at each other, Yahushua, Yahuwah said that at midnight tonight he will pass through the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn sons will die in every family, from the oldest son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the oldest son of his lowliest servant girl who grinds the flour. Even the firstborn of all the livestock will die. Then a loud cry will rise throughout all the land of Egypt. A wailing sound like no one has ever heard before or will ever hear again. But among Yisrael it will be so peaceful that not even a dog will bark. Then you will know that Yahuwah makes a distinction between Egypt and Yisrael. All the officials of Egypt will run to me and fall to the ground before me, begging, please leave, hurry, take all your followers with you. Then, O oh mighty Pharaoh, and only then will I go. So he was even turning that on him. I'll go when I'm ready. Even when you tell me to leave, I'll go when I'm ready. That reminds me of uh, Yahushua. Yahushua went when he was ready. They bashed him, they whipped him. They had bits of stone, a, a bone, cat of nine tails ripping his flesh apart, crown of thorns digging into his skull. They bashed him, they nailed him to a torture stake. He could hardly breathe. Why didn't he suffocate? Why didn't he this, why didn't he that? He was just bleeding out everywhere, but Hashitan and no one on that earth, on this earth, could tell him when to go. He offered up his spirit. He offered himself up as the ultimate sacrifice when he was damn good and ready. He did it when he was ready. And Musha said to the Pharaoh, only then, then and only then, O great Pharaoh, will I leave. And Musha had left the Pharaoh's courts furious, but Yahushua had told Musha earlier that the Pharaoh would not listen to him and that he would do even more mighty miracles in the land of Egypt. So this was the plagues and the wonders Musha and Aaron performed right in the Pharaoh's face. But Yahushua had made the Pharaoh's heart rock hard and he wouldn't let Israel leave the country. 
Okay, so we're gonna leave it there. So today, guys, that was a fair bit of reading today. And that was the 10 plagues. Those 10 plagues, those same plagues have begun. The bowls, the, the what are the trumpets, the bowls, all those things in Revelation have been un, unrolled, un, they've been blown. They're, they're in the earth, they're happening in the earth, you know. You know, the horsemen are out trying in the, across the earth. The plagues have been unlocked in the earth. It's happening. Do you face that? This is the, it's not coincidence. Yahusha is blessing and cursing the world. The world is under his wrath. The world is in darkness. And these plagues that we're reading about are in the world right now. Just look at the news. Look at the murder. Look at the famines, starvation, wars. Natural disasters. Are they natural disasters or is Yahusha punishing? Sickness. Every second per I'm in the community working with people. Every second person now has uh, got some kind of cancer or, you know, disease. Is it a coincidence? And I find it humorous that people are forming organisations. One of them is called F Cancer, if you see cancer. F Cancer. I'm thinking, what, you're going to tell off, are you? This is a plague. This is a curse and a plague for disobedience, for evil behaviour in Yahushua's face. He's had enough. With a strong and outstretched arm, he's standing up, flexing his muscles like he did in Egypt. He's doing it now. So face what you see around you, brothers and sisters, and rejoice that we are protected in the tourist zone. Stay on your path of obedience. Because if you stay on your path, you're in Goshen. And Goshen is protected. No death from the cattle, no locusts, no plagues, no gnats, no Sulanuth. What about the Sulanuth? Oh, that was fantastic. I love the Sulanuth. The Sulanuth. The Loch Ness monster came and ripped open their knees with his five metre long arms and nails, has cut them open. Oh, that's fantastic. It's just like you, Sha. I love you guys. Next week we're going into the very first uh, official Passover in Egypt. And the blood of the Passover lamb is the catalyst for Yisrael's deliverance. Fantastic. Love you guys. Bye-bye.